before we talk about the responsibility that you want to place on artists and politics, the responsibility of politics on artists, let's talk about class. And I think what's, what's unique about your book and I think what's groundbreaking about it is how you describe class, how you work through class, and I think more importantly, how you give people a, a literally a tool to help make sense of their world through class. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found really valuable. Um, I like things that give me tools to help me understand my world and, and move through it, which I think your book does. Can you describe a little bit and break out a little bit how you structure class and then um, how we can use that tool in, in our work? Well, actually, I mean, one of the interesting things about this panel is that it's uh, people working in a variety of different fields. So I'm actually interested to see how other people use that tool or whether they think it's usable. But um, I mean, I guess what I'd start by saying is that I think that class is actually a classic example of a fuzzy concept, which means that when we talk about it, we are, we think we, uh, we think it's an obvious concept that we know we're on the same page, but actually we're often talking about a bunch of different things. So, um, and I can think of at least three um, things, and I talk about all of them in my book, and I think they're all important, but um, uh, one I think is particularly useful for artistic labor. So you could, I think most of the time people intuitively would think that we're talking about wealth, you know, how wealthy someone is. And we live in a very unequal world. And the art world is very connected to that inequality. So, and I have a chapter in the book called Art and Inequality where I try and like trace how the kind of intensification of inequality has affected a lot of the institutions of the art industry. Um, but that's, I don't think that's the only thing we mean when we talk about class either because, you know, like a unionized worker could actually make a pretty good salary, you know? So you can be working class and not be, you know, the poorest of the poor. Um, and, you know, Steve Jobs can work for a dollar a year, you know? <laughs> um, it doesn't change the fact that he's, like, a really powerful man. Um, then I think um, another important way people talk about class is in terms of sort of like something to do with education and privilege. You know, when you s talk about um, this person's middle class, you really mean they've had op uh, access to certain kinds of opportunities. You know, they're a college educated person and working class people are come, you know, haven't had access to those kind of opportunities and that's important too. And I, there's a chapter called uh, The Agony of the Interloper in my book where I talk a lot about that because I think you know, the language of professional art is often very opaque and obscure and not very hospitable to people who haven't had certain kind of educational background. And I, I think that's really important. But I think there's a third thing which is less obvious to people, um, but important to me, and comes from the Marxist tradition of, of, of why, why, why class was interesting to people in the first place, which has to do with questions of power and questions of where your labor, the kind of labor you do, and where it sits in the economy. And um, in that way of thinking about things, there are workers who, um, you know, trade their labor for a wage. And there are people who are bosses, capitalists, who own things and hire people to, to do stuff for them that then they make money off of. And that's really the, the center in, in, in the society we live in. It's, it's dominated by big corporations, that's like the big relationship. Um, and the interesting, what's interesting, why that's interesting originally is because the worker in that setup, it's not just that they're oppressed or exploited, it's that they have a particular kind of relationship of potential power. And on the one hand, they, they're alienated, they don't have a say over what they do, that's what the Communist Manifesto means when it says you have nothing to lose but your chains. You know, it means that you don't, you don't have a stake in this. You know, you don't get a control of what you do. But at the same time, you're the, you know, workers are people who make, they do the stuff that makes the profit for the people who control things ultimately. So potentially there's like an interesting relationship of power there. You know, if you, if people don't work, then they don't make profits and you can kind of shut things down and you have like the potential to have like political agency in society and even, even change how society works in a really, you know, a way that's worth thinking about. But 
that leaves the question, and this is where I became interested in the idea um, and how I started, you know, I thought it was really transformative for the way um, some of the problems, the debates going on um, in the 2000s about contemporary art is that there's this other category, middle class, labor, and there's actually a theory of that within, it's maybe under-theorized or not talked about as much, but within this sort of classical Marxist tradition, there's a theory of that too. And in that th middle class people are the people who are kind of outside of um, the kind of labor capital binary, you know, like shopkeepers, uh, small farmers, um, self-employed professionals, and, um, and artisans. And it's it, who, people who are basically their own boss, you know, who they're exploited, they're not like, but they have, they have a little bit more agency than other people. They're, they're, and I remember an activist colleague talking to me and saying, um, about her own mom and saying, you know, well, my, you know, it's not just about wealth, you know, it's not just about how money you make. My, she was saying, my mom is a, is a cleaning woman, you know, but she owns her own cleaning service. You know, she employs two people and, me, and she still, she still works. She's a, she's a maid, but, but, but she does a lot of the same things that someone who works in a hotel would, but she works for herself and that changes some things. It changes the amount of agency she has. Um, in some ways, it makes her life less stable, you know, because she's she doesn't necessarily employed in an ongoing way by a, by a hotel or something. But she has the ability to, to a certain extent, um, determine some of the condition. You know, she could say no to jobs, for instance. So you have a little bit more agency. And um, I think that's if you think about there are lots of debates about that. You know, in the '80s there was a whole debate about the new middle classes, like managers who are you know more part of the corporate structure but are kind of still a middle layer of things but what i think is interesting is that artists visual artists are actually a pretty clear example of middle of the middle class form in that perspective because it's very different to create something on your own that you then you have agency a say about how it gets produced and then try and sell it on to a gallery or an institution than it is to ex be a designer, for instance, who solves a creative problem for someone, uh, but doesn't get to determine the parameters for that problem. And I think that, that uh, there are a lot of questions um, that that just, in some ways, a kind of remedial distinction, but, but it actually like, clears up a lot of, a lot of um, it opens up. It, it opens up a whole new way of thinking about it, things. It's an interesting thing, and I, and I want to ask the question of, of you guys, especially this idea of the middle class artist. When when I went to work for the San Francisco Film Society five years ago, Graham Leggett, uh, the former artistic director who's no longer with us, would say that what one of his major goals was building a network for middle class artists to be successful within the city which he attached, and I don't want to speak for Graham too much, but he wrote about this as well. I think I'm fairly accurate describing what he talked about. The idea of providing a certain level of financial stability was how he really looked at that issue. Meaning if, if you weren't able, able to make X amount of money per year, um, that um, would not allow you to enter into that middle class. So, meaning he tried to create grant structures and found foundation money to help people get to that level. So for me, the other interesting thing about what you talk about is then, then how do we assign value? And then is there a difference between middle class art and lower class art value? And then how does that function? And, and, that, and it made me sort of think about this too in terms of activism. So then when you throw in the middle class artist and then you call the middle class artist an activist, what does that do to the value of the work? Um, and, and I was wondering if you had any impressions on that and from the New York perspective. I think here in San Francisco, the danger for middle class artists is the, is the label of work for hire mm -hmm. or, or, the, or the label of the shame that gets attached to the activism which ultimately devalues the art uh, and turns it into something else that people don't understand. I think the documentary filmmakers have a, a huge problem with this and, and are constantly trying to prove, oh no, man, I'm not working for the organization. You know, no, 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 that's not what I really think. I'm just, uh, you know, in, in order to preserve value. 
Do, uh, do you have thoughts on that? And then I'd, I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit about that. Maybe your experience with Open Heart would be interesting to talk about as, as well. Um, I, I just would say, I wouldn't say lower class. I mean, I, Sorry. I, I, I mean, I mean what I, one of the things I think is interesting about the theory, you know, is that, um, is, I, I know it actually seems a little bit counterintuitive to, to unhook the, uh, or to, to look at dimensions of class outside of, of wealth and poverty. Or, or, but I would actually say that for, art, for, for visual artists, it's very clarifying. Because I think one of the confusing things about discussions about like, artists' place in the economy is that artists are often very poor and, uh, and are ripped off by, by galleries, by institutions of all kinds. And so they identify with being a worker because it's like a name for people who are kicked around. But at the same time, artists clearly have a different kind of privilege, you know, the, in that they they have more freedom about what they do um, than than other people. So I, I think that's that's a really uh, now. Of course, the thing is that most artists aren't most artists identify as artists, but aren't actually making their money. They're making their money doing other things. You know, they're actually usually working class in terms of where they actually. Um, get their get their money, and it's almost as if the ideology of being, um, you know, the the dream of doing something you love and getting paid for it, is is obviously people. Everyone wants to say that you know, there I'm a fully realized person. I get to I get to I do what I I do what I love. So so it almost functions to me. It seems it function ideologically, um, and you see that I think in in um, the National Endowment for the Arts put out this report on the creative workforce, which is, I think is a lousy term. Um, and it clearly shows that the major by the vast majority of contemporary creative laborers are what you call designers. Um, and sometimes designers of a kind that, you know, like display designers at, at, or even industrial designers, people who work for big corporations and are measured accordingly. Um, but the interesting thing is that the report is illustrated with a picture of an artist in his studio at the easel painting. And even though the report itself shows that like less than probably like 3% of all people who are categorized artists are st studio artists or what you would call fine artists. And there's a an reason for that. It's not just because artists are, have this easy iconography attached with them. It's, it's because the idea that creativity is this free thing that um, you, where there are these people who who get to do what they love and um, are celebrated for it plays a big role in in, um, in 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 sort of hiding some of the alienation of a lot of other forms of things that um, you know in in the, in the um, uh, my sister who I don't know if she's here but she's a video game designer right or or, or worked as a video game designer and she said something to me that I I always have 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 thought um, was really profound she said you know I've done work I'm proud of. Um, but I've never worked on a, I've never worked on a video game that I liked, you know, and I think that's really profound um, to think that there's, because it's almost the opposite of just the way we talk about visual artists and the way they get, you know, the idea of the visual artist gets used. You know, Subway calls its workers sandwich artists, you know, but they're clearly not artists in the sense <laughs> of, that, of that guy at the easel painting. So let's let's open that up, sandwich artists. So if, if we're talking in terms, J Jesse, maybe we can talk from you and we can work around back, back to Eric. This, this notion of middle class, how you value your art, have you thought about uh, your work and, and your approach to work and, and, and how you self-identify yourself within that structure, meaning class? Yeah, and I think more and more so um, the older I get and the more kind of family responsibilities I have. When I was kind of young and free and had few obligations, um, I could make choices that um, felt less constrained by my class position, perhaps. And, and, and I'm, I guess I've, I've become much more conscious of the, f the freedoms and the lack of freedoms that I have in my life because of my, the position I occupy um, and the choices I have to make about whether this I can pursue this art project or this work for hire that I could kind of dress up as art, but really isn't. It's really work for hire in the kind of creative um, field. And um, I've had to kind of go through this period recently of, of kind of coming to um, a decision about my relationship to television 
you know, and mm -hmm. I've done so much of it to sustain my career as a filmmaker over the years. And it's always been somewhat uneasy. And sometimes there's a sweet spot where you can feel like you do real creative work and you still satisfy your corporate bosses. But I finally, one, had to accept that I just couldn't keep doing it without really handing over my soul in, in entirety. This was after producing an episode of Doomsday Preppers. That was the, <laughs> that was the, that was the end for me, right? But, 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 you know, the position that's left me in is, you know, uh, if I want to pursue my independent projects without any kind of institutional funding, you know, I need to be kind of frank with myself about the freedoms I can afford uh, in my life. And it's funny because I was just, there was a discussion in New York the other day, there was a, there's a documentary film festival going on right now in New York, and there was a discussion about how to balance, you know, your art, your film, and your family. And, and I was reading some of the discussion about it, and one of the comments, this was an assessment of the panel, was Mary Rich. And, and I really think, I was glad somebody said that because I think, you know, it explains a lot of artistic freedoms at a certain age, you know. Um, so I'll leave it there. Hmm. Mary Rich. Okay. <laughs> I like that. No. <laughs> well, um, I guess one thing that I really do enjoy about being a practicing artist and an activist is the fact that I can, I can spend time in a studio. I am a studio-based artist. I can hardly afford it. It's really tough in San Francisco as well. Um, but uh, basically, the way I would describe my practice is that um, I'm really interested in the art form because of its ability to contribute something um, productive to the world that is outside of the capital system that we normally engage in. So that whether uh, you're an abstract painter and you add a mark to the war, or to you know, just a, make a beautiful line, uh, or um, if you are making work that's highly documentary or politicized, you're contributing something that wasn't there. You're adding to the world. And, and um, so I like to have my practice be something that does both, is that there's something um, uniquely interesting to look at, to visually engage um, a pop whoever wants to look at it, to think outside of the normal constraints that we think about every day, and then perhaps to also open uh, up a point of view, a perspective of something that you might have not thought about before or just didn't have time to think about, which is why often my work deals with war and, and uh, its representation in news media. So uh, with, with that in mind, I think um, basically it is a privilege to make art and um, not I try to keep my art practice sep separate from the other types of work I do to make the ends meet. So I'm not interested on, in taking commissions that would have me make work that is art, but not what I want to do. I would rather work at a coffee shop, or I would rather do something else that is divided and separate. So that's an important distinction for me. I mean, I think one of the big tensions that I feel that I want to point out is that there is um, a heavy gravitational force towards um, the organizations, the nonprofits that, that actually have the financial resources to support documentary work, but they want, and it's like television in a way sometimes, they, you know, they, but they really need work that, that aligns with their mission objectives. And sometimes that can be very exciting and artistic and liberating, but it's limiting and it, I think it, uh, it defines a lot of what work can be, and it, it leaves a kind of big space of work that can't get funded, that's neither kind of aligning with those institutional in interests um, as kind of, you know, progressive and, um, you know, as much as I might identify with them. And then, you know, um, television over here, and, and I, you know, I feel like maybe all of us, we sort of struggle in that, in that middle space, but I, you know, and I, I, I um, I, I felt this strange kind of dichotomy to it at a, at a film event recently where they had, a, um, they had somebody come out and talk about the metrics that can be applied to that kind of documentary work to assess its utility value. Like, did it work? Did it, you know, to drive the objective of the NGO? That was one presentation, and we're going to use all these tools to measure that effectiveness. And then the, the other presentation was we're going to show you Doug Aiken's video art and say, isn't this, this isn't about, you know, this is about something else. This is just about him kind of satisfying his creative whims. And it's like, 
they couldn't, dis you know, it was sort of like it's here or here and, and we don't kind of, we, we exist in documentary somewhere in that, somewhere in between. And I don't want my work to be, you know, assessed with that, um, that metric, you know. This is interesting. I think there's a very similar discussion in visual art right now around uh, social practice, which is what they call, um, I mean, it's not exactly documentary based practice, but forms of art that are, have very specific um, activist kind of agendas, you know? Um, so there are examples of like people doing a, 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 a boat that provides um, abortions in countries where they're illegal in international waters, for instance, but as in funding it as an art project or people doing different sorts of um, community discussion groups or, or um, other kinds of, uh, you know, the famous one in, in, in South Side of Chicago, where an artist named Theaster Gates uh, creates these, this sort of almost kind of like community space, but as an, but as an artwork. Um, but the discussion about social practice has become really dominant, particularly, I think, in New York, but particularly outside of New York, because it's a, I think it, it really becomes a question of how people get make art. You know, what are the metrics? How can you convince, particularly in a time when like resources are being taken away, um, and the the funders are very loath to fund things that um, that that you know they want proof that it that it matters to someone you know and so it, it's for me it's it, there's a real tension in the discussion between on the one hand it's it's artists looking to do actual you know to reach out to new audiences and do stuff but on the other hand there's something about it that assumes that art is a that art that doesn't have like deliverable metrics mm -hmm. is like a luxury mm -hmm. that, um, that, you know, people um, just don't deserve, you know? And I think, so there's a real tension, I think, uh, right now around that very question. It, that is a really good point. And I think we should talk to Eric a little bit about this because I think Eric is a really good example of being somebody to some degree stuck in the middle of a foundation and an artist. Before I let you kind of talk about this, this is, I like to think of this as almost like we're in a predicament that is very similar like working with a studio um, with a foundation. It's sort of the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We, we're all trying to solve big problems in the world, but there's a really important necessity for foundations at this point and, and people who do give to get a return on charitable investment and to be able to prove that this is having impact in the world, which is a real pessimistic view, but at the same time in a world of limited resources, very difficult. Eric, your situation with Keith Davison is very similar. You're a nonprofit organization that had a film done about your organization. You use it to make a case for support. Skoll funded, as well as Sundance funded, as are many of uh, Jesse's projects as well. Um, and I've had many conversations with you uh, separate from both the foundations. We've done panels when we had the foundations and Skoll talking about big ideas and you know it's wonderful they came in on this film. But what is your impression of the value and the return on that charitable investment that those organizations made on that uh, film that Keith gave you, which is a great film, by the way. Um, yeah, well, so the return on investment. Um, so my role in that is um, to, yeah, it's a hustler. I got to get that out. I got to get people, you know, to see it. You know, my primary function um, in my job and why I was able to go from a volunteer into a paid staff position, which kind of relates to, to Ben's point and what I found clarifying in the book is I'm a, a lucky person to be able to go from what I did in my free time as a volunteer to now for the past three years, this has been my full time job. Um, and I feel very fortunate to be able to do that because I often say and honestly feel like with whatever self-awareness I have that I'm in my dream job which is meaning I get to spend most of my time. And I think this is the point that we have to think about and ask ourselves is how do we spend our time? It's the, the resource that we as humans have the least of. We can always generate more money or uh, more resources, but our time is the most valuable thing. And if we end up in these systems and that are requiring us to do things that we don't really like or they're stifling our, our creativity, um, then that's why we have these, like Sanaz was saying, these day jobs at a cafe, so I have the freedom. I'm taking, I'm claiming my own freedom, my own time. And I think that's the very revolutionary act of reclaiming one's own time to pursue those things. Where we get into trouble is then how do we pay the bills? And part of my role as a fundraiser, as for an organization, 
um, in different organizations is trying to solve that problem and fill in that gap. So uh, as a non-artist, uh, you know, oftentimes my role is trying to take work with, and, and we intentionally as an organization, you know, we have a two-fold mission that's very important to us. We provide high standard, free of charge health care to victims of war and poverty, and we also promote a culture of peace, solidarity, and respect for human rights. And the way we intentionally decide to promote culture, specifically that culture around human rights, is by partnering and working with artists. Because we feel we value the arts, we value artists, and that as an opportunity to have these conversations with folks around what's possible in the world, and particularly around these very heavy issues of civilian victims of war, children stepping on landmines, um, but having the hopeful side of, of health as an opportunity to heal them. So with Keith Davidson's very well done, powerful film, um, Open Heart, it was a short documentary, uh, and not work for hire. Uh, Keith knew nothing about our organization or our hospital in Sudan through a series of his own hard work and, and circumstance, as well as funding, right? He had this independent funding, as Michael mentioned, he had to fundraise with his producer and his team, trying to get this hustle on their end to make this film. Um, and it was nominated for an Academy Award earlier this year, won other um, film festivals as a short doc. It's now airing on HBO. Um, and the position I'm often in with this film is wanting people to see it but have limited access because this is the filmmaker's film. He's the artist as a documentary filmmaker who focuses on human rights, respecting that and respecting him and his team and what they need to do to be able to recoup maybe pay back some funders or get the word out about, because um, he's on to, right, as a filmmaker and as an artist, you're on to your next project. So the organization, we're in the position with this film to uh, try to raise awareness uh, about our hospital. And for us, it's really important because we work in these war-torn regions that get filtered uh, to us through the media in these dehumanizing ways. Um, and so for Keith's film, it was really helpful for us because it's, it um, takes on uh, these stories and amplifies the voices of these people in Sudan. In the film, it's eight kids from Rwanda, um, but there's other folks you get to meet in the film. So as an organization, to Jesse's point earlier, you know, we, as an emergency, we did, it was very important to us, not that Keith made a commercial for our organization, but that he understood the, our desire to have this film, and that healthcare is a human right, and that becomes clear in the film. It was up to him, however he edited it, whether he honored that or not, but it was an agreement early on to see if he understood that, to provide him access to the hospital, in the operating room, to the patients, and with these kids. These are the, their lives now, they're being you know, put in front of millions of people they will never meet, and, but understanding that the, the coming together around agreement and solidarity around human rights, that that isn't about us as an NGO, him as a filmmaker, but it's about the broader sense of equality and, and exposing uh, these inequalities that are the situations these people exist in that cause these healthcare issues, but the opportunity for human rights through uh, us as one small organization and these hospitals. And these hospitals are built as high standard hospitals that we in San Francisco or New York will want to take our families to. So there is this attention to aesthetic beauty within the architecture for no other reason than this is a place to heal. We're not interested in the impact incomes of having a garden in our hospitals. We have gardens in our hospitals because it's a place for healing and that's what we see effective and humanizing in these situations. So as uh, being in between there, so through the film, you know, and through uh, some of the film partners, they learned about the organization. They wanted, they were moved by the film. They provided us kind of with the one-time grant, gave us some, some meetings as well. Um, but it's not the one uh, silver bullet solution. We're still pay, you know, pounding the pavement, meeting with our current supporters, and most of our funds come from individuals um, because of, as a human rights organization, we don't seek or receive funds from uh, corporations that are human rights violators or profit from war. So that limits us and it provides us focus on individuals. Well, let, let me ask you this. Let's just, let's just cut right to the chase. I mean, you as an executive director of this organization, do you feel that film actually helped made, make your case for support? Or is it something else? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a tool that has its place. Um, and it's a short doc. You only have 39 minutes. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's been a struggle for us to fill in that, that larger story about the organization, that these issues are still going on. The hospital still needs funding. There's people who still need surgeries. Uh, there's people who are still dying. 
um, and that we were doing our best to treat them. So it, it helped, but it wasn't the, I think oftentimes in having managed expectations on these things of like you know, the Academy Award nomination being on HBO, this isn't the proverbial millions of dollars falling from the sky. Right. I think that's the thing to be, to be honest about and to understand as a nonprofit is that I think this is the outside expectation and maybe even one I might have had early on in my career. Uh, but coming into this, this has been a big part of my role, is being able to manage that and try to keep it focused and still you know, have that partnership and respect for the filmmaker, but also keeping it clear to our funders that like, this isn't the, the magic solution. We still have to organize, we still have to be advocates, we still have to um, talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, and we still have to get the word out um, through our personal networks because it's about that collective energy of everyday people who we already know who want to help see, you know, change this make the world a, a little bit better place with the privileges and the resources that we have. So I wanted to make one point now that I've attacked uh, the commercial television world and institutional funders in their defense. I want to say that you know um, ar you know this artistic work doesn't come into being through a process of immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. And 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 something that I read recently that I took some comfort in is that both the Road to Wigan Pier by Orwell, which was a very inspirational work for me and this current film I'm making and uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, both began as commercial commissioned assignments that were killed. And um, so whether it's a commercial assignment that develops, a commercial assignment that's killed, I mean, I think there is great value for, you know, creative professionals, artists to take commercial commission work. I mean, I think it, you know, um, I struggle with it, but, but, but it really, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, the, the film I'm making began as a commissioned assignment that was killed, and that's why I took comfort in, in reading this. And I, I, not to compare my work with theirs, it's, but, but I, I just think, um, you know, art has a strange way of coming into being, and, and you, and, and I think to sort of, to try to wall, wall myself off from those avenues would be probably self-defeating. <laughs>